In my spare time, I watch a fair bit of sport, mainly boxing, but I do have at least a mild interest in quite a few sports, be it football, tennis, or even F1. And I think the times when just any sport has really captivated me is when there is a real contrast at the top level. What I mean is that when you think about any real great periods in sport, they are often dominated by a select set of people at the top who are often chalk and cheese in both how they play their game and also their personalities. Rivalries like Federer Nadal, Messi Ronaldo, Prost Senna and even Khabib McGregor I think really stand out in history, not just because they are amazing athletes, but more because there is a real degree of contrast at that elite level. Basically, whoever you are and whatever little interest you have in the sport, you will know people who will either want to play the way one guy or girl does, or simply just hates the personality of the other. And you often find that these athletes by themselves would not be anywhere near the draw that they ended up being without their perfect negative image. I mean, how many people would be tuning in to watch Khabib fight without the prospect of McGregor looming over him? And yeah, I'm not saying that these guys wouldn't draw any sort of interest, but what I am saying is that in order to break into the mainstream audience, you need a degree of contrast at the top. Of course, there are exceptions. Usain Bolt and Mike Tyson are the ones that spring to mind, but those are just that, exceptions. And that is where Alexander Usyk and the heavyweight division comes into the mix. Because, as I'm sure you're all plenty aware by now, the heavyweight division is rocking, and whether or not you are one of those people who say that the guys from the 70s or 90s would have absolutely starched all of today's heavyweights, I think the contrast at the top is one of the main reasons that people now are tuning in on a regular basis to watch these guys square off. I think Klitschko is actually a perfect analogy of what I'm trying to say here. For 10 odd years you had these brothers at the top with no real competition bar a David Hay or maybe an Alexander Povetkin. And these were two guys who while they weren't exactly the same, they were hardly a million miles apart when it came to fighting styles and even personalities outside the ring. You're boring. I want to rid you out of the heavyweight division. Your jab and grab style, surely all of Europe wants to see you get beaten and all of Europe and the rest of the world will see you get beaten. You have about as much charisma as my underpants. Zero. None. So fast forward to today, and whereas before you had just the equivalent of white bread and soup, now we have an absolute smorgasbord of personalities and just attitudes to fighting generally. Personally, no matter what Aram and Warren try to tell me, I don't really like watching Tyson Fury fight. Yeah, I make boxing breakdown videos on the side, so of course I appreciate good boxing to a point, but I am still very much a boxing fan who likes action first and foremost, and bar Wilder 2 and the Cunningham fight, I wouldn't really say I've been really entertained by any recent Fury fight that I can think of. But that is not to say that I wouldn't want Fury in the mix at all. Yeah, what he says outside the ring can be tiresome. And yeah, I'm not sure I trust him to split the bill fairly, let alone to set up a million pound fight. But I do appreciate what he brings to the mix because it results in some really interesting matchups with the other heavyweights. And that is exactly how I feel about Usyk, albeit for slightly different reasons. I do tend to watch boxing in a little bit of a bubble. I don't really talk about it too much in real life, bar one guy who predominantly watches MMA. Shout out, you know who you are. And that brings with it a degree of problems. The thing is, is that I'm at a university now. I have a full-time job and some other responsibilities on the side. And that means that I do need to pick and choose which fights I watch because I simply can't watch them all without giving up entirely on my social life and ironically, this YouTube channel. And couple that to me living in the UK, there are often fights that I simply need to watch on a Sunday morning. And there are some that, in short, I really struggle to give a shite about. You know the types. Santa Cruz UD over 12, Bivol UD over 12, Yard knocking out another nobody in four. 
These are guys that I know are good, but I just struggle to look forward to. And I will be honest that Usyk was someone who, prior to this video, did slightly slide into that category. And that is partly my fault, and in my opinion, partly the fault of the people who are actually promoting this guy. The first real hurdle that Usyk needed to overcome promotional-wise was the fact that he was fighting at Cruiser, which is very much a European division. And maybe I live in a position of privilege being a UK boxing fan, but I'm very rarely interested in watching two European guys go at it when a Brit isn't involved. I think that's partly due to there not really being much of a buzz about those type of fights here, and the fact that not much English is actually spoken on the press tours doesn't help. And the second reason I don't think Usyk is really that big is that I don't think he was really sold to the public in the right way. Prior to making this video, I'd seen a fair bit of Usyk. I'd seen him against Hunter, Bellew, Chisora and Gassiev, but I was no Usyk expert by any means. So my vision of him was kind of driven by the media and the so-called experts. And how the media was trying to sell Usyk is that he's some insane once in a generational type fighter who can outbox absolutely anyone with ice skates as feet and the brain the size of a supercomputer. And to me, that is only half right. Yeah, I think he's one of the best fighters in the world, probably on the pound for pound list. You know, it's funny because he and Lomachenko have a, a, a similar dynamic in this. They're more of these modern of Eastern Europeans. They have those, they have the great fundamentals that Eastern Europeans always bring, but they also have this fluidity to them. They, they're almost like a, a new age evolved Eastern European fighter. So they don't, you don't get worse, they only get better. I do get why the media are portraying him like this though, because he is an incredible fighter with incredible feet. I mean, you don't get Olympic gold without great boxing skill, but I think a lot of people do seem to be truly missing the mark on what makes Usyk such an amazing fighter. What I'm going to do now is dive right into the Michael Hunter fight, and this was no easy task for Usyk, with Hunter being an undefeated fighter at the time who had a reach, speed and power advantage, and to tie a bow on the Hunter advantages, the fight was taking place in the US. On a bit of a side note, for all my videos I like to break down multiple fights for one fighter rather than to simply look at one fight in a vacuum. And how I choose these fights is normally decided on what I feel is a good representation for that fighter's skill set at that time. And so I picked the Hunter fight because I think it is the first real world level fight that people say Usyk really struggled in. But now, after watching it in detail, I think it's also a fight that really illustrates Usyk's strengths, weaknesses, and just his fighting style in general. And for anyone who is completely new to Usyk, it's a style that is based on fundamentals, activity, and steady pressure using the feet out of the southpaw stance. And obviously, I'll go into this further down the line. Not only are we going to get to see maybe the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter of the world, Lomachenko, but an Alexander Usyk probably the most talented and skilled fighter north of light heavyweight in the entire world and he's in with a real fighter in Mike Hunter. So Usyk comes in and does a lot of the things that I'll refer to later in this video as well. He initially starts by trying to press the fight by throwing a lot of feints, both using a variety of foot feints where Usyk comes into range and then bounces back out of range, and level change feints with the lead hand where Usyk feints to Hunter's body. He also does a hell of a lot with the lead hands in that southpaw stance. It's definitely been said before, but in a southpaw for the orthodox matchup, the jab is often a really hard punch to land, chiefly because it becomes much easier to block an opponent's jab with your own lead hand, since the jab trajectory is basically over your own glove, and I really hope that makes sense. But what that means in practice is that in this type of matchup, there are often very few jabs landed by either fighter, and the tactic normally involves distracting or feinting using the front hand and capitalizing big with the rear one. Adonis Stevenson or Rigondeaux are probably the best examples that come to mind with each using their own techniques, of course. But what Usyk will often try to do is to use a non-committal type jab to try and force the opponent to cover up and then in that moment to move round to the opponent's weaker left side. This then leaves Usyk in a good position to throw his left hand where his opponent cannot properly respond. 
Usyk can do this move using a jab, he can do it following a left hand, or he can simply just throw it out there with no punches preceding it at all. And from what I've seen, it's the jab and step that Usyk likes the most. And it's this stepping technique which is one of the absolute cores of Usyk's game. He's trying to throw one big punch, like he just threw a straight left, but he's not pulling punches. Alexander Usyk is not throwing punches in combinations. Now he just threw it. And if you think to five minutes back or however long I've been rambling here, I did say that I think the media has slightly missold Usyk because I don't believe he is a masterclass boxer in the same vein of a Floyd Mayweather or Pernell Whitaker. Because in making these moves early on in the fight, Usyk does leave himself open to the counters. Usyk doesn't just go hell for leather and try all this weird and wacky move straight out of the gate. Even throwing just a few slow front hand shots and pivoting early in the fight does give the opponent an opportunity to pivot and counter before Usyk can get off his own left. And I'll go over a few more fights in a little bit, but it is definitely possible to catch Usyk in these transitions with the right hand. What is actually difficult is to sustain reacting to these movements for the full 12 rounds. And now we end up with basically Hunter's overall game plan for the fight. It was, in effect, to try and catch Usyk in these transitions, swarm Usyk with activity, who does tend to defend with a pretty static high guard relying mostly on his legs, and to, ironically enough, try and outmove Usyk. Plenty of times in the fight, Usyk would be pressing forward with that high guard, trying to close the gap on Hunter, who would then leap in with a big right hand or combination and then spin out to either of Usyk's sides. It wasn't particularly textbook boxing, no pun intended, but because Hunter is so long and athletic, he did have plenty of success using these kind of moves early on in the fight, especially to Usyk's body, which can be exposed with that static defense. Right now, Hunter's timing really good, hitting Usyk, engaging when Usyk is not expecting it. Has Watch. a real offbeat rhythm. Watch the foot movement of Hunter. Hunter is not standing still. He's given subtle movements to the left and right. That's important for positioning. So, this was the deal. After three rounds, Usyk was marching forwards and Hunter was throwing a lot and landing a lot by using his raw athleticism to explode and switch on Usyk from the outside. And that can work if you have the gas tank to back it up. The thing is, is that at this weight, fighting the way Hunter tried to do, you either need to have some insane punching power or speed to keep the guy honest, or you need to have some damn good technique to plug any holes and to conserve your stamina down the line. And that second point is where Hunter fell down. In round four, Usyk started pushing the pace and those explosive leaps that Hunter was making earlier in the fight just looked a little bit more laboured, which meant that Usyk could afford to sit in the pocket a bit more and begin to time Hunter as he exited. Usyk also threw some pretty decent shots to the body, which could have taken even more out of Hunter. And this, I believe, is the absolute cornerstone of what makes a typical Usyk fight. Yes, another fighter is the ability to win the early rounds using that raw athleticism and range, but if the opponent is using short bursts of explosiveness to do it, it is only a matter of time once they slow down. And once they do slow down, those angle switches suddenly look a lot more effective when the opponent doesn't have the foot speed to defend it. As a bit of an aside, Usyk doesn't just use punches to mask an angle switch. Another little tendency he has is to lean to the right from a high guard position, and this is the benefits of either slipping an incoming jab or to mask an angle switch. So imagine you're in Hunter's shoes now. You're kind of tired from the first three rounds and you have feints, non-committal jabs and the lean to the right, all of which could potentially lead to an angle switch. And now you start to understand why fighters just wilt when they're in against this guy. Now as on an incredible engine and it's no wonder that most fighters just seem happy to reach the final bell. Hunter had his moments in there in the later round, sure, and for anyone who is completely unaware, this is actually regarded as one of Usyk's toughest ever fights. But in the second half of the fight, it was only going to go one way. Hunter would lunge in, Usyk would shell up, and time Hunter as he exited. And just as a little final point, 
I also noticed that Usyk has a really interesting tendency to let his left foot go completely off the floor as he throws the left hand. And this is something that he has done in all of the fights that I've seen. He pretty rarely throws it from the center of the ring. And it's more something that he throws when the opponent is exiting or following an angle switch. But it is really interesting and definitely something that is not taught in standard gyms. The traditional theory goes something like this. If you let your rear foot go off the floor, your head moves forward and that leaves you in a much more open position for any potential counter. The positive of using this technique is that it gives you extra range on your power hand and that in letting your rear foot forward, it gives you more options with regards to your follow-up combinations. It's not something that Usyk has been found out for majorly in his career yet, and considering how much of an emphasis Usyk puts on his ring IQ, I'd be thick to think that he's not aware of it, and I'd be even thicker to say that I know more than him on this, but it's definitely something to be aware of, especially since now he's going to be fighting guys who can hit much harder than the cruiserweight Michael Hunter. But anyway, Usyk got the job done on points through greater overall technique and a better engine. And while Usyk lost rounds, it looked like a 8-4, 7-5 kind of fight. Competitive, but clear. From Simropol, Ukraine, Alexander Alexandrovich I'm going to finish this little section off with this clip here. It doesn't look like anything much. It's just a foot feint, then a level feint, and then a double jab that leads to an angle switch. I can't even say much comes of it. But the reason I wanted this clip here is, look at the time. This is round 11. When do you see someone who is Usyk size able to perform these feinting techniques with such great execution late in the fight? This is the secret to Usyk's success, at least in my mind. And it's not like he's doing anything crazy in there, or even with much athleticism. It's more just the sheer consistency and solidity in his work. And he must have made a pretty good impression on Michael Hunter, because Hunter has gone on to predict an Usyk win against AJ, which is just about the highest praise you can give. I think, um, I think Usyk would uh, get him on points, you know, just off of the legs and the movement and um, southpaw stance. Southpaw stance. You know, the the guard. You know, the, you know he has a very good guard. Um, What I'm going to do now is skip forward to the semi-final of the World Boxing Super Series, a tournament-style competition actually run by the same people who run the Champions League, a major football tournament. The format went like this, eight enter, four are seeded, four are not, and one winner at the end. Blissfully simple boxing, I know. But anyway, in the semis, Usyk took on WBC title holder Marius Brudis in Latvia. It's kind of common knowledge now, but a few years ago, it wasn't really acknowledged how little shit Usyk gave in traveling to another fighter's backyard. And to be honest, I don't know if Usyk is really supported by the general population in Ukraine. So it might just be a case of, if you make the most money in your opponent's country, you might as well fight there. But for whatever reason, you do need to give Usyk so much credit for fighting literally everyone in their backyard. Maybe it's that amateur pedigree thinking of, well, a boxing ring is just a boxing ring. I don't really care where it is, but it's just so refreshing to have someone who honestly does not care where the fight takes place. And this is something that he said plenty of times in interviews. If you want to be recognized as the top athlete, you have to come to other guys' territory. You have to fight them over there and you have to win. Uh, that, is, that is the way to become really undisputed. But when Usyk did face Breedis, it looks again like your pretty typical Usyk fight. If you're not a hardcore boxing fan, you may not really know who Marius Breedis is, but he is definitely no mug. He went on to win the next WBSS Cruiserweight title. And you could see that class from Breedis pretty much for the whole fight. Usyk came out like he normally does, trying to push the pace and get Breedis to react. You can actually see a good three or four Usyk tendencies in the first 10 seconds of the fight. 
a level change and feint, a little bit of a non-committal jab, and some leaning to the right. It's all just typical Usyk. You can then see Usyk threatening the angle switch as early as round one. But the issue is, is that Breedish was just countering over the non-committal jab before Usyk can make the angle change. And as I've said before, this isn't particularly radical thinking by Breedis, but of course you do need a very good degree of skill in order to pull it off. And this coupled with some really solid body punching with some dragging down of the Usyk guard, and you have a real fight with four rounds gone. This clip here really illustrates the game plan that Breedis was going for trying to work Usyk's body, making the most of that static high guard and dragging down the hands when he has a chance, and then to counter the non-committal jab with that right hand over the top. The issue is, is that like against Hunter, Breedis could only keep up this pace for so long. To be honest, maybe actually pace is the wrong word. Breedis wasn't really throwing all that much in the fight, but again, it is just the energy that comes from reacting to everything that comes your way, rather than you leading off and taking the occasional break. And I don't want people to come away from this video thinking that the only reason Usyk is great is because of his engine. What I mean is that it takes an unsustainable amount of energy to just keep up with Usyk's skill. It's kind of like swimming against a strong current. You can succeed for a bit, but in the end you will likely get found out. And likewise, the better overall technique you have, the longer you will probably survive. Breedis is a pretty damn good fighter, and like a few of Usyk's opponents, he was actually undefeated coming into this fight, but I wouldn't ever call him fleet-footed. This isn't necessarily a bad thing since you're often set to plant your feet for counters, but what it did mean is that when Breedis tired, he was more susceptible in losing his defensive shape, especially when Usyk started working the angles. As an example, look at the difference in the footwork here. Willingly conceding that this is the biggest fight of his career as he lands with a good left hand which drives Breedis backwards. Breedis becoming a little... Or just how effortlessly Usyk reacts to the right hand feint and then slides directly back into range. These aren't especially well-beating moves. They just show that against Usyk, you really get nothing for free, especially combined with that very solid high guard. So we're in a position now where Breedis is still in the fight, landing single shots, but starting to tire. And Usyk is holding the center of the ring and pushes the pace as he always does. And another thing is that if you face Usyk, you've got to have a plan A through Z in order to get the win. Breedis had lots of success using the straight right counter, but as the fight progressed, Usyk started to read and counter these right hands. What he'd do is slip outside the right and throw a left to the body. Sometimes Breedis wouldn't even throw the shot, Usyk would just react to the right hand feint. But I think this illustrates that yeah, Usyk fights do have a tendency of looking kinda similar when watched one after the other but he is definitely a guy who can make adjustments on the fly. But for the sake of thoroughness, you still saw those lean to the right type moves, sometimes leaking into the angle switches. You had Usyk using the jab to mask those same angle switches, and you still had all of the positives and negatives of throwing that left hand while the left foot is miles off the floor. For instance here, Usyk would not be able to land the left hand in a traditional stance, but in lifting the foot off the ground, he can now create that extra length and still be able to slide out to the right hand side before the counter comes in. It is truly beautiful when it all comes together. However, Usyk, like all fighters, is not perfect. And when he occasionally does miss the target using this technique, he is normally just standing there square in a high guard position, which can of course get taken advantage of. My best guess for this is that he is just so well drilled at finding these angles, this is just part of his game he can't quite turn off. It's not an absolute deal breaker, but if I can notice just how open Usyk can be in these exchanges, 
I'd be surprised if others hadn't at least made a note of it. But anyway, using these techniques to just out-hustle breeders down the stretch got Usyk a close but deserved majority decision. And it's only really now that I realise that I haven't really talked much at all about Usyk's actual personality. And that is a shame because despite the guy not speaking too much English, he is definitely a character. And if you think all the way back to the start of this video, I said that contrast is one of the things that I look for most in boxing, and you can't say anyone else at heavyweight is quite like Alexander Usyk. <laughs> Ukraine is not exactly known for its long and proud history of comedy. Well, maybe it is and I have no idea. But what I mean is that when I think Ukrainian boxer, I think much more of a Klitschko-esque fighter than an Usyk type fighter. Maybe that is a little bit old fashioned of me and if that is completely wrong, I do apologize. But damn, Usyk is a funny guy and does not keep at all with that Ivan Drago-esque stereotype. I remember reading an old YouTube comment saying that there weren't too many sarcastic boxers in the game. And once I had a bit of a think, Usyk was really the only guy who fitted the bill. He's kind of hard to pinpoint when he's being serious and when he's just straight up trolling. And in an odd way, I think that adds another layer to what makes him so hard to read in the build up to fights. The guy is also straight up hilarious with this being his trademark line. Only one day to the fight now. How do you feel? I'm feel. I'm very feel. No problem. No problem. <laughs> How are you feeling? I'm feel. I'm very feel. <laughs> I mean, if that is not on a t-shirt, someone in marketing is just missing the mark. Also, only Alexander Rusik could make getting coffee into a must-watch experience. Can you make a good tea? Yes, it does. Where's my one? For me? Yeah, it's coffee. It's coffee? No sugar. Okay. No sugar, zero sugar. Just on the Very nice. Yeah? Very good. Maybe sugar? Maybe, maybe one sugar, thank you. Okay, how? One, two, three? Six, please. Six, okay. One. <laughs> three. three. Three, thank you. Six? Yeah. Snizok. <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of joking nature made the run up to the Bellew fight just so intriguing because Bellew is a boxer in very much a traditional mold. Highly strung, highly aggressive and very certain in the way he articulates himself in the pre-fight. And so stick these two together and you can get some really quotable lines. And he says he has the one thing that you don't, and that's the power, the punch power. How do you answer that? Don't shoot it. He's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we will soon see, my friend. We will soon see. He passed the comment after Saturday's little stare down, and the comment that he passed is, he thinks I'm arrogant. Monster. Ah, I'm you, white you rabbit. Are, you are a monster. I'm white rabbit. I'm not monster. So he <laughs> says he believes I am arrogant. If only all build ups could be as entertaining as this, eh? Tony Bellew is not a guy who has great athletic skill. He has some solid attributes, sure, most notably being very decent power. But like Usyk, he is someone whose greatest strength comes from not only his fight IQ in a fight, but also how he breaks down fighters before the fight. 
and barely will have noticed how Usyk broke down Hunter, Gasiev, Bredis, Glavaki and Huck in the second half of the fight. So, in the pre-fight presser, Bellew made clear what his intentions would be, and it was not to fold mentally. When that low blow goes on, I'm a different person. And no matter how good they are, no matter what he does, I am not going to stand there like this. I will not stand there and just allow him to go and rattle off four fives. It will not happen. It can't. Because I will not stand in awe. I will not admire him. I won't. I will fight with everything I've got. You will have to nail me to the floor. Also in the lead up to this fight, Bellew talked about how Usyk was a great fighter and that he simply could not outbox him. But I didn't believe Bellew for a second. We saw in both Hay fights and even against Stevenson down at 175, that Bellew has real confidence in his boxing skill. And that isn't unwarranted, so I never believed that he was just going to try and rush Usyk, especially because, as I've kind of already said, Usyk has been outboxed for sustained periods before in his fights. And so Bellew did what I thought he would do and try and outbox Usyk in basically the same way Breeders tried to do, albeit slightly less aggressively. Sit back and wait for Usyk to make the move and then capitalise on the slow front hand of Usyk with the right hand, while also try to throw long rights to the body to slow the movement of the Ukrainian down. It's probably worth me explaining at this point why Usyk throws the non-committal jab as a non-committal jab and not just as a normal full speed one. And if you think differently, do write it in the comments down below because despite me having a decent following here, I'm more than willing to accept when I'm wrong, but here we go anyway. When you're in the ring against the top opponent, the very last thing you want to be is predictable. So what you can do is throw a few slower punches to almost lull your opponent into a full sense of security and then explode with your own shots at full speed. This basically keeps your opponent from getting their timing down on your shots. Also, not stepping in with 100% power means that Usyk is able to keep such a high activity, which he wouldn't be able to do if he was sitting down on everything. And finally, the punch itself being slower actually blinds the opponent for a longer time than if the shot was thrown at full speed, giving Usyk more of an opportunity to slide to his opponent's left. And I do realize I made about three points in there to cover my own back, but in boxing, nothing is really clear cut. But anyway, back to Bellew. He was countering well with the right hand and going to the body well also. He was also well aware of any angle switches that came his way, and you can see Amir pivoting with Usyk. He wasn't making huge reactions when it came to the Usyk feints, so in short, he definitely looked like he belonged in there. You can make an argument that Belly won the first three rounds. That being said, the commentary was ignorant at best and biased at worst, with Froch saying things like this. Usyk's had it all his own way his whole career, and all of a sudden he's finding himself in the lines down here in Manchester against Tony Bellew, who's got the backing of the crowd. This is on their territory. Another great round for Tony Bellew. I mean, the guy has fought Kasiev in Moscow. I doubt Manchester is really going to worry him too much. But the problem becomes that because Bellew was reacting to Usyk with such ferocity, this of course led to tiredness. You can see how hyped Bellew got for this fight. And don't get me wrong, that is just the way Bellew is. You can't change that. But when you have a fight like that, that is throwing counters with such venom, it can only last for so long. By round five, Usyk was starting to be able to step round Bellew. He wasn't doing much with it, but he was just starting to make those angles work. Another issue is that Bellew holds quite a low left hand in his guard. And what that means is that if the big right hand is not there to deter Usyk, Bellew doesn't have much of a defense if Usyk decides to make the angle switch to Bellew's left side. And so what you saw is Usyk growing in confidence as he stepped round more and more, up to the pace landing more shots and eventually caught Bellew with that big left hand. He's really closing this gap with, with real, you know, middle of the push. And that's what he lights out for Tony Bellew. 
It would be really easy for me to sit here in my nice chair and say that Bellew should have done X, Y, and Z more often, but in truth, he was just spent. And as I've kind of already touched on, one of Usyk's most underrated skills is that he gives away nothing for free. He is as good in the 12th round as he is in the first. And there is a certain irony in that the fighter is regarded as one of the best technical fighters of this generation, just takes that part of your game away through will, activity, and just incredible schooling. I know I'm scrolling back a bit here, but look at the subtle footwork. Really confident, he's setting traps here. He's trying to lure Music in. He's trying to draw him in so he can land a big counter punch. And here it comes. It's first a foot feint, then the level change feint. Usyk then puts his hands up to block the potential counter right from Bellew. And then once he realizes Bellew is now not set to let his hands go, Usyk dives in and throws the punches. It is just a beautiful sequence. And if any youngsters want to learn some boxing fundamentals that will last you the whole fight rather than on a 30 second highlight reel, watch Alexander Usyk. Bellew was understandably gutted in the post fight and credit goes to both guys for just being so classy in a sport where both of them know they have nothing else to prove. Make sure you clap him, because he's an exceptional fighter, and he deserves all the awards in the world, man. Alexander Usyk is a great, great champion. But I think one of the major things that this fight will actually be remembered for is Usyk going up to heavyweight. And he answered the how will you prepare for the higher weight question in true Usyk fashion. Конечно. Я ещё буду дополнительную порцию макарошек кушать и вообще будет всё кульно. Yeah, of course it's enough. I will have uh, another extra pasta for dinner. <laughs> and that was that. Usyk had cleared out cruiserweight and now he was moving onwards and upwards to heavyweight and in the late replacement, Usyk faced Chaz Witherspoon in his first fight above 200 pounds. And it was a fight that was kind of a tester for Usyk, dipping his toes into the heavyweight ranks. I won't go into this fight in detail too much on the basis that at the higher weight, I think Usyk was playing it fairly safe despite all his amateur experience and experience in other formats like the World Series of Boxing. And he got a bit of stick for this fight on the basis of not looking exceptional against a pretty ordinary opponent. But as someone who hadn't actually seen this fight before doing all the research for this video, I thought that this was a pretty typical performance for Usyk. The thing is, is that Usyk is not an explosive fighter. He's a fighter who is geared towards doing the basics well and consistently over the 12. And so he's not the type of fighter who's going to blow a fighter away in two rounds, which ends up on the highlight reel. I mean, the guy wasn't a puncher down at cruiserweight. He was coming off an 11 month layoff. And in his entire career, the earliest stoppages he's had are two knockouts in three rounds. I'm not going to stand up here and say that it was absolutely vintage Usyk because it wasn't. But the fact that people were basing Usyk not doing well at heavyweight off this performance, I think just reflects that people don't really understand what makes Usyk so special in the ring. And you can also see that Usyk is not one of those guys who wants to necessarily decapitate you in not only his style in the ring, but also in his interviews outside the ring. And while a lot of you watching this now may think, well, pretty much no boxer wants to physically hurt someone permanently, I'd have two points to counter that. A, a lot of fighters do think this, but simply don't come out and say it. And B, when you're in the ring and the punches fly, you can almost be in a primal state. So while logically you would never want to damage anyone permanently, when you are in there, it can be very much a kill or be killed mentality, whether you thought you had that side of your personality in you or not. And that is why Usyk stands out in his mentality because it is very much technical boxing for him rather than violent fighting. Maybe the fact he's so religious helped him with this philosophy because despite being such a joker, he is very much a deep Christian man with deep Christian beliefs. Since when asked about how he has such enthusiasm for life, he gave this as the answer. 
когда ты веришь, Really confident in my life. Coming back to what he does inside the ring, Usyk now has had a fight at heavyweight. He's 33, so still just about in his prime, but he does need to make some moves fast if he wants to fight anyone elite at heavyweight when he's still at his peak. And so Eddie Hearn decides to put him in against a fighter that is basically the benchmark for heavyweights, Derek Chisora. Usyk did his best to sell the fight with a video that still gets me even now. Derek! I'm coming for you! Derek! The fight, in hindsight, was a pretty good move, at least in my opinion, because for anyone who isn't British, Derek Chisora is a guy who has a bit of a cult following due to his continual reputation for turning up against world level fighters and a more than entertaining personality, where a slap or the throwing of a table is not out of the ordinary. He also had nine losses at the time, which if I'm honest, possibly made them even more endearing to the British fans. Here in the UK, we do love a trier. And while I wouldn't dare say that to Chisora's face, I think it adds a little bit to the he's one of us persona that British boxing fans love. And those two personalities led to some hilarious pre-fight verbals. Listen, listen. Все говорят, что определяется вот... It's back and forth, back and forth, heavy, not heavy, strong, not strong. If the king of animals would be detected according to the size, then elephant would be the king of animals, not the lion. So if you want oh, oh, to oh, see... Let me correct you now, please, please. An elephant is the king of the jungle for the simple reason. A lion is only brave when there's loads of them. And when an elephant, when he's by himself, he can attack a head of lions and get away with it. Elephant is a friend of a mouse. That's, that, that's, that's what you had in Disney. That's what it... During the press tour, I can't remember many high-level fights that were so clear in what each fighter was going to do. And a lot of the time, fighters say I'm coming for a scrap, but then proceed to dance around the ring for 12 rounds. But I think everyone believed Chisora when he said he was just going to make it a street fight. And while 90% of people were picking Usyk, I do remember there being a pretty good buzz for this fight generally. That foot is in range, Derek Chisora will swing, Derek Chisora will throw, and Derek Chisora wants him in that range. So for the first time in Alexander Usyk's career, he's not going to be able to dictate things with his feet like he did against me, like he has against Morat Gassiev, like he has against Marius Braves, all these guys, he's dictated the range and the pace and, and, the, and the, how the fight goes with his feet. He can't do that in this one. Saturday night, trick or trick, we're going to trick or trick on the Ukrainian guy and we're going to bust him up. <laughs> when I was writing boxing articles, I remember using the phrase the bull and the matador more than once, but I don't remember too many fights looking quite so emphasized as this. A lot of the time in boxing, you only really see similar sized guys fight each other, so it can be kind of hard to gauge real world sizes for fighters, at least for me. But when these two were in the ring, you could see the difference of a medium-sized heavyweight to a medium-sized cruiserweight. Chisora's back, legs, arms, just everything looks so much bigger than Usyk. And Chisora basically just tried to big brother his ass around the ring, imposing his size and physical strength. I wouldn't say Usyk was ever really hurt in the early goings, but you could see from his body language and just some of his foot movements that he definitely wasn't comfortable having someone like Chisora be so reckless towards him. Chisora was doing what he'd said he'd do. It wasn't particularly skillful, I'll be honest, but against Usyk, he was never going to win an amateur-style boxing match. What he tried to do was literally walk Usyk down. Chisora would often come square or even southpaw to try and cut off the exit angles, and at this point, he would just try and hammer away to the body, throw a crude right hand over the top, or just try and mug Usyk on the inside. 
It wasn't particularly pretty to watch, but I don't really think you could have asked much more from Chisora given his overall skill set. The thing is though, being as big as Chisora is and trying to maintain any sort of work rate is tough unless you've got the nutritional intake of Jarrell Miller. And so despite Chisora starting fast and imposing his size, as early as round two, Usyk was starting to establish some sense of range. And by round four, those heavy overhand rights were being more and more sporadic. In terms of what Usyk actually did to nullify Chisora, it was quite typical Usyk. He'd try an exit of Chisora's weaker left side when he could, and when he couldn't, he moved to the right. And when he'd do this, he'd often keep a very high left hand. In some gyms, you'll hear the term holding the phone. And it was really effective here. But what didn't actually help is that Chisora never really threw the right hand straight. He only ever looped it round to Usyk's side, so it wasn't really that difficult for Usyk to read the punch because it was always coming at the same trajectory. Chisora was having his moments in there and he was definitely landing some good shots here and there, but I think someone like Bellew, who is Chisora's mate, may have got a little too caught up in the emotion of it all. Uh, I thought he was, you know, four nil up after four rounds. He's dominating everything. Who's that? I thought he lost Derek Chisora. I thought he was putting all the pressure on. He's landing the better shots. Alexander Usyk was finding his way in. I think it was the fifth round, and I thought he got he got Derek's attention with a sharp left hand that brought it round the side again. That round's a little bit harder to, to you know to make the best of. But for me, Derek Chisora's winning this fight so far. By the second half, it did start to look like a typical Usyk fight, albeit a little more circumspect than when he was at Cruiser. He'd throw non-committal type shots using the front hand as Chisora came in to occupy him, and then suddenly Usyk would then sit down on one or two of the shots before exiting. Usyk also began timing Chisora as he walked in, making him pay for literally walking forwards and sticking his head out. And of course we have those trademark angles being used offensively, which only got more effective as Chisora tired. By the time the end of the fight came, there was a clear winner and Chisora was not it. And despite Chisora stating that he thought he won the fight, there was no doubt who deserved to get the W here. In the post fight, Usyk was asked about whether he thought this performance answered some of the questions that people had about him as a heavyweight. And I think his answer perfectly sums him up. I don't know. <laughs> it's questions. Fans. Fans. Uh, experts, brackets, you know, what I mean. This is a world championship level boxer who has become undisputed in a weight division. A guy who has won a gold medal at the Olympics. Do you think he cares about what people who have never laced up a boxing glove think of him? And as a fan, that is kind of a tough one to take. There is a great scene in Ratatouille of all films which says that the work of a critic is almost always lesser than the work of the humblest of artists. And in a weird way, you can apply that same principle to boxing. I think it's the idea of mocking fighters that risk their own health in the ring that I never quite agreed with. And despite the fact that I create my own content and pass my opinion on fighters and their performances, it is always meant in the most humblest of ways because I could not get close to what these fighters do. And I do have great respect for Usyk, not just because he is a fighter, but he is a fighter who has such clear goals. Whereas both Fury and Wilder have seemed to not really want the big fights in the division for whatever reason, Usyk is a guy whose goal is dead set on becoming undisputed, and this has been something that he has repeated over and over. I need to become the undisputed heavyweight champion. As soon as I become, I will turn back and say, guys, thank you very much for your participation. Thanks everyone. I will thank the Lord. I will bow to the ground and say farewell. I go home. Just finally, your English is great by the way. Does the goal remain the same to become heavyweight champion and do you still believe you can achieve that? Absolutely champion of the world. The undisputed heavyweight champion. 
Brilliant. Thank you very no much. No just me. world champion. No just world champion. No just world champion. Undisputed world champion. And something is so refreshing about just having a fighter who generally doesn't care who he fights and where. He just wants the belts. And I believe him so much because he has already done it at Cruiserweight. And while I, of course, want AJ Fury at some point, I have so much respect for Usyk for not wanting to take step aside money to make that fight. Will you allow the Fury Joshua fight to take place? If they if they ask for my permission, I will not allow. What if they offered you lots of money? Happiness does not lie in money. Very true, very true. AJ was at the Chisora fight, and Usyk being the WBO mandatory challenger meant that he was in line for that fight. And so, post Chisora, Usyk called him out in just typical Usyk fashion. I called him and asked him how his work was, and he said, Anthony, how are you? I'm coming for you. Uh, I greeted him, asked how, what are you doing? How is he? And uh, I shouted the message for him. Like he said, Anthony, I'm coming for you. The fight is extremely interesting, especially given Joshua's gas tank. So the question will be whether Usyk's footwork and engine will be enough to overcome Joshua's power, length and technique on the inside. I won't make a prediction here, but I'll stick it down below in the comments. For the record, I could see both fighters winning, but don't worry, I'm definitely not offensive to when it comes to my predictions. But anyway, I was planning this to be a slightly shorter video that definitely didn't work out. But with Usyk, there are just so many layers to him, be it his fighting style, humor, and personality in general, that I think he is far more complex than many people give him credit for. People tend to lump him in as a bigger, less explosive Lomachenko, but in doing so, I think they are missing out on what is possibly one of the most unique boxers in the sport today. And whether he beats AJ or takes an L, I would be very, very disappointed if he wasn't in the heavyweight mix because there is truly no one else like him. My fans, UK, America, Europe, Asia, I love you. <laughs> I am Phil, you feel? Yes, I'm Phil. I'm very, very Phil.